Hi, everyone. I'm Terry Evans, deputy editor of Entrepreneur.com. Welcome to our live chat series, where today our special guests are the sharks from the popular ABC reality show, Shark Tank. And today the sharks are here to answer your questions about the show, about each other, about advice on pitching investors. We're going to cover it all. Uh, some of our readers have already submitted questions, but keep your questions coming on Twitter using the hashtag ENTLive. Um, okay, so let's, let's meet the sharks. Um, we have uh, Lori Grenier, um, also known as Queen of QVC, uh, with her success with hundreds of product launches and holding more than 100 patents. We have Barbara Corcoran, uh, long been known as a real estate mogul in New York and beyond. Um, we have Damon John, a uh, branding expert and the man behind the wildly popular urban uh, clothing line um, FUBU. And we have Kevin O'Leary, who is also known as Mr. Wonderful, sometimes sarcastically so, <laughs> who became a billionaire after starting his software company from his basement. So uh, let's start out, Sharks, with um, could you give us a kind of a behind the scenes um, secret, what, uh, what folks don't see um, when they're watching the show? Like a Can I start? Cake? Sure, Barbara, go ahead. My favorite secret that people at home just don't get to see, and that is when the entrepreneurs walked onto the set through the big shark tunnel and told to stand there, the producer says, don't talk until the sharks talk to you. So picture yourself in their shoes being really hyped up, all set to give you a pitch, and then nobody talks to you for a full five minutes. You fall apart. That's the meanest darn trick, and we love it, because we get a first impression on how that guy or gal is under pressure. I love that one. <laughs> That's well, excellent. Barbara's saying something interesting about the making of television. The mm -hmm. truth is 95% of what's shot never makes it to air. So, you know, we spend a day and a half making one show. A lot of stuff goes down that people never see. I can't wait to see the outtakes of Shark Tank sometime. Crazy. Oh, yeah. Yeah, I think I think that's a valuable point. I think that I think our our shortest pitch was 22 minutes, and our longest pitch went on for about two hours. Is that the case? Wow. Yeah, an average of those pitches is about 45 minutes. So a lot of times when people, yeah, a lot of times when people see us make comments such as, uh, you know, you didn't answer all my questions right, or or something else, and they go, I didn't hear you ask that that many questions. They don't realize that we were sitting there for an hour grilling those people. And Damon, isn't one of those uh, tomorrow night? I think that was one of the longest pitches. It was agonizing, wasn't it? Yeah, you'll see tomorrow night in that pitch. Obviously, we moved to a new time, 9 p.m. Uh, Eastern Standard. But you will see that I will be so <laughs> aggravated in my chair. And, and you know, somebody said, well, yeah, it's not new, but I'm extra <laughs> aggravated. You know, I'm, I'm, I'm just You're really going like, through your change of life, I think, through the whole season. Yeah. <laughs> I, think, I think that tomorrow night, uh, at least for me, and I think the guys will agree, was one of the most agonizing, shocking, surprising pitches ever. I actually got up. Remember, Lori, I got up and walked away and went and got a donut yes. and an apple and came back. Yeah. Damon, <laughs> Damon got up, stormed out in the middle, and then it went on so long and was so agonizing that he came back in about 20 minutes later with bags of chips and an apple in his mouth, and that his arms, amazing. his arms full of snacks. You remember that, Kevin? I do, and you know what I say? Poo poo happens. It just <laughs> does. And it did. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Great. R really good stuff. Um, you know, a couple of questions ca have come in about valuation. And this is something that um, comes up a lot on the show when, it, when you talk about how much money you're going to give for what percentage of the company. Um, so several people have asked this. David Hewitt asked um, on our website and also on Twitter at cube underscore MN asked um, about valuations. How do you, what's your methodology and what should entrepreneurs keep in mind um, when they're making their valuation and their pitch. Well, I'd like to take a stab at that from a very basic and, and, and you know pragmatic way of looking at it. If you come in with a product or service or idea that doesn't even exist on the market and tell me that it's worth uh, ten million dollars and that we have to put in a million dollars for ten percent, I ask myself, could I do the same thing myself for less than ten million dollars? And if the answer is yes, why would I invest in that entrepreneur? How dumb is it to make it so expensive 
that I could go do it on my own if I wanted to. And that happens a lot. People are very greedy, and I think it's a big mistake because you never get any money. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You, know, you know what I think? I think these guys spend so much time talking about valuations, they don't know what the heck they're talking about. Nobody knows how to value a business. It's mostly out of your gut. I get made fun of a lot of overpricing things. Well, guess what? I don't give a crap about overpaying for something if I know I'm going to make extra money on it. All right? There's no rules. Everybody thinks there's a rule out there. Trust me, measure all the rules that the guys use throughout the entire season, and you'll find it fluctuates all the time. It's all nonsense. That's my opinion. So listen, I'm apologizing for Barbara right now. She hasn't finished my course on capitalism. She's only in the second term. By the time I finish with her, she'll understand what valuation is. Trust me. I'm sure. I'm I sure. Think, Meanwhile, I'm counting my money. I think I can agree on both sides. I think the valuation when you're when you're talking about a business that you want to franchise and that it's very very yeah. it's very obvious about the numbers and how you're going to grow it over a course of time. The valuation can be pinned down fairly easily. I think that on the flip side, if you come in there and you made two million dollars worth of worth of problems and you try to put that into your valuation like that's our problem, that oh. that's unfair. I think on the other side, if you come in there with a proprietary product or an idea, like I walked into my partner and said, I have a hat, I have LL Cool J and a bunch of rappers who want to wear it, I couldn't put a valuation on that. So it really, uh, Barbara, I think is accurate. It can fluctuate. I agree too. I, I, I think it. I think both things matter. I think the valuation can, can fluctuate, but I think if they come in with something that's just ridiculous, you notice all the sharks get turned off immediately. And I, I, think, I can draw a cat for you like that one. <laughs> <laughs> and if they if they come in with something that's reasonable <laughs> and we think it's something that's great, I think it's a mixture of the valuation and your gut instinct or feeling about okay. what's going to happen with the product. But there's valuations, Laurie, on both sides of the table. If they're coming in there and they only want to value their company, how much is the valuation of one of us assisting and or, you know, uh, helping them with their product? Sometimes, you know, that's a reverse valuation that they're not respecting. Yeah, you're right. I agree with that. And I'm, I'm happy to report so, that I so just when an entrepreneur that comes in, valuation instead of evaluation. Why didn't somebody tell me that a few years ago? <laughs> You know, at the end of the day, if you invest yeah. money, you want to get it back and then some. Because you put it in harm's way. You're investing in a deal. You could lose it all. So it does matter. The value matters. If you yeah. overpay, you don't make any money. It's that simple. When you don't make money, bad things happen. If you do that enough times, you end up broke and you're sitting on the side of the road eating government cheese. You don't want that to happen. Yeah, well, we're missing Mr. Moneybags, Mr. Cuban, who usually says valuation doesn't mean anything. But... You know, I think that no matter what, when you go into a store, you need to know some kind of price that you're asking. But, of course, he's not on here because he just, you know, <laughs> pays for everything. <laughs> you still with us? Hello? Hello. Ooh. I think we might have lost her. We might have lost Tracy. She's so stunned by what you had to say. <laughs> It's market confusion right there. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Hey, I don't know if this thing is still live. We could start talking. Okay, give us your theory all over again, Kevin, on valuation. <laughs> Barbara, you so started exciting. it, you know. It was That's so the... exciting. We don't know if uh, anybody's with us here. Well, I'm, well, going to, I'm, gonna take, I'm going to ask Barbara a question from the tweet. Patrick, tell them uh, we lost our host. We're all live and moving, but she's frozen. I, I'll take over hosting duties, Barbara. <laughs> right is anybody out there, Kevin? I'm gonna, I'm gonna go to, I'm gonna go to Twitter right now and ask a question. Okay. Let me jump out and ask him over here. All right. Are we on an island alone? So Lori, Lori, I'm gonna ask you a question. <laughs> okay. So how? Hello. Do, can you hear me? Yeah, we're back. back. Can you hear me? Yes, I can. Tracy, you're oh. back. Am I back? Back? I didn't even realize Tracy. I was lost. Okay. Tracy, okay. So we kill valuation. What else you got there, Tracy? <laughs> okay. okay. <laughs> Next question. Okay, it's Terry, but thanks. <laughs> so, um, hey, you it. Get it right, Barbara. <laughs> <laughs> Go ahead, Julie. Go right ahead. <laughs> I think we lost her again. She's frozen. Terry, Terry keeps freezing. Uh, it's bad internet connection. So I'll. So I'm going to ask you a question right from Twitter. Yeah. Yes. This is to Lori now. 
you mm -hmm. call products heroes or zeros. What makes you so smart, and how do you really know it's a winner or a loser? <laughs> uh, 16 years of experience in knowing what works and what doesn't work. Um, but I think that it's a, truly, I think it's a gut instinct that some people have and some people don't as to what's going to be wanted by people in the marketplace. But I also think that um, some of it, you know, if they, somebody comes okay. in and shows that there's experience, and that something has been a, a winner already. Yeah, yeah we, we can hear you. Have a viewer question. Yeah. I, I was answering a Twitter question presented by Kevin from that's Twitter. And that's Mr. Wonderful. Okay. All right. <laughs> but I, I, I don't know where I left off. <laughs> you were saying it was Laurie, a lot of Mr. Laurie, Laurie, Okay. Lori, what's Let's your percentage on. of being accurate against not accurate on, on heroes or zeros? What's yeah, my percentage? What, yeah, what's your I batting have, average? Because you I can't have, have all winners. My batting average, I have a 90% success rate on new products launched. That's better than what I do with husbands. <laughs> yeah, I'm, I'm the opposite. You know, everything I think is a hero is a zero and vice versa. I just invest in the people for the most part. But, yeah, uh, I'm always shocked at my outcome. I'm going to pick you a husband, Barbara. Oh, please don't. I'm stuck with one for 24 <laughs> years. I have no idea. He'd be too expensive to unload. <laughs> the All truth right, is, so let's though, get you back don't to know it. what's going to work, and you have to have a portfolio of ideas. You've got to invest in a few things because you don't know which one's going to make you the money back. You know, some of the best ideas I saw Barbara put her money into went to zero right away. It's amazing. <laughs> You're a mean guy today. All right. So <laughs> let's start with another. Let's take another question. Okay, um, this is from uh, a Twitter handle, Ringle Dingle Two, Brett Ringleham. What's the worst investment you made on Shark Tank? Oh, I have one. Okay. Um, Toy Guru. It was the idea was the Netflix of yep. toys, and yeah. mommies would rent their toys, then the kids would throw up on them, and then they put them back in a box and mail them back. Then they'd steam spray them <laughs> and send them out again. Oh, that was not a good idea, and it went straight to zero, straight to zero with a bullet. Also, really bad management. But yeah, why were you management so management taken management up with them on air? I, I, li I like the idea because I, I was involved in the toy industry for three years with Mattel. They bought my company. You and should I watched, have known better. You and I watched, you known better. I watched how mothers can't stand the fact that kids only play with toys for 90 days between the ages of one and three. So this concept was every month you get a bunch of other crap you can play with. It made total sense to me and I think it would still work if we had better, that's the trouble, you don't know how the managers are until you actually work them for a while. In that case, I, it was bad management that blew the company up. I think I can agree with you. Barbara and I went in on a deal with a young lady's uh, company it was called Gila Bentley, year one. Um, I went out and I made all her first samples. It was. Um, uh, let me interject. It was a. It was a, a women's clothing company for uh, women with curves. Plus I size women, yeah. And I, great samples we made, but I think the management, um, you know, it, it really, you know, we haven't heard from them since. Have you, Barb? Barb, have you heard from them? Uh, yes, actually, I, she's uh, she's going through New York as we speak, pitching a new show on how to dress chubby girls. Mm. Swear to God, Barbara, I don't think you can use the word chubby. You can say Rubenesque. Rubenesque. Okay. Husky. 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 Okay. And but Barbara, let's not what's forget. What's wrong with her is she was she didn't have the talent to uh, bring the bacon home. She had Barbara, the talent. What about that deal where you invested in elephant snout enemas? What happened to that? They weren't enemas. They're medicine dispensers. <laughs> and and she's doing enormously well. Go to any of your local drugstores and pick a few up. They're only ten dollars. Ava, Ava, the Ava, Ava the, the elephant. Come on, Ava the she's elephant. a phenomenal businesswoman. <laughs> but it was a, it was an enema, Barbara. It was not an enema. Enough. <laughs> Next question. What, what was it called again? El Elvira okay, the enema. Okay. <laughs> All right. So so we're we're moving on from from Ava the elephant. Okay. Um, Lori, Lori, is there? Did you want to chime in on something that um, an investment you made that maybe didn't turn out what you expected? No, that hasn't happened yet. But I'll let you know in the <laughs> future. Will. A few more seasons, Lori. It will. <laughs> I did have one where um, the product didn't turn out, so I couldn't make the investment. Oh. What in terms of manufacturing? It just it right. wasn't. Right. In terms of manufacturing, it wasn't working out on their end, so we never could even move forward. Was it too expensive, or just wasn't able it was to be manufactured? Malfunctioning. 
Oh wow! Okay. Lori, okay. well, how many deals were you not? Lori, how many deals were you not able to close? Not because of the product, but because you know uh, the fourth season in, a lot of these entrepreneurs are saying, "Well, I'm a star now, and you know it's not the deal that I wanted to take on TV." And they they start having all these lawyers and friends get in between. Has well, that? Well, I was going to say. You know, we all, I think we all agree that um, people that come on without genuine interest to close their deal mm -hmm. really shouldn't be coming on to Shark Tank. It's not, you know, that, as Damon always says, you know, you take away from someone else who genuinely wants and needs our help. So for those that come on, entrepreneurs that come on thinking that they're just going to get publicity, but they it's, do get publicity. It's, it's, very the wrong, it's the wrong thing to do and mm -hmm. um, it's not something that I think uh, is a smart move or, or a fair you know, the, the truth is the platform is grown so big now that people know if they could just get on the show, there's a Shark Tank effect. For example, some of them get on to Good Morning America. I have one deal that just this morning aired mm -hmm. in an area that I thought I'd never invest in. You know, most of the food, okay. dog food, and those kind of deals, Barbara buys all those. But once in a while, I said, what does she see in all this cake and cupcake stuff? So I invested mm -hmm. in one, and they just got on Good Morning America. They've mm -hmm. sold so many cupcakes, they're going to spend the rest of their life making them now. I know. My scrub daddy was on, on Good Morning America, too, today, and it did phenomenally well. Yeah, yes. That guy's that guy's crazy. My scrub, scrub daddy, daddy did phenomenally well. I don't know why you didn't let me know that deal. <laughs> <laughs> What's your problem? You didn't take your Wheaties today. <laughs> you know, my, my I wife wanted deal. You didn't let me in on the deal. You know, <laughs> I didn't cost you another hundred, but you're gonna make a million. So I don't really know if I feel even better about that. Now, now my wife now, watched now, the Scrub Daddy deal. I'm gonna let you in on an, on my next deal, okay? Like my <laughs> wife, my wife was watching Scrub Daddy and said, "Kevin, why didn't you invest with Lori in that stupid sponge? She's gonna make a fortune." And I her fangs were out. Her fangs I, were out, Kevin. And she was she was just vicious. She was greedy. I was happy you won, Lori. You won it fair and square, and the guys are now jealous and complaining. I am. And I'm, and I'm being very honest about it. I'm so All right, we're, Okay, we're going to take another question. Who can believe a scrub daddy sponge? A sponge with a smile on it. Just ridiculous. <laughs> so, so we're going to take another question now. And this one comes from Twitter, uh, from um, Twitter handle Inventioneers, um, and the question is this, when making a pitch, is it more important to stress the problem and your solution or how your product will benefit them? And I'm assuming that means how your product will benefit the investor. Both are important, mm -hmm. equally important. Mm -hmm. well, I think definitely the, the why it would be a good investment mm -hmm. is very important. I mean, I don't think if they don't prove that, then nobody's really interested. Would you guys agree? I, I think the ones that can explain the opportunity. Always know how some new investments, sadly. Uh, all the all the great deals on Shark Tank are the ones that get explained in ninety seconds or less. Take Scrub Daddy for example. Within ninety seconds of the guy bouncing around with that sponge, everybody knows what that thing did, and that's why I got an investment. So I think the formula for success is. Practice your, you know, your, your skills in communicating it to the investor. Make sure you can do it in two minutes or less and explain why it's a great benefit. People can understand a product or an idea, but you have to differentiate product versus company. Those are two different things. And not everything we see is a company. We see a lot of products. Every once in a while we see a company, and that's a different kettle of fish. You want to know something, Kevin? Every product you ridiculed on the set telling me that it was not a company, you were dead wrong on. My most successful products became companies because they were a great starter product. I don't know why you keep, you keep putting that out there. You're going to make people feel as though they have something not worthy to start off with. You've got to start with one thing. You don't start out with a whole shelf full of stuff. The, ri the risk of having, saying? here's the reason. If you have a single product and it fails, it's not a hero, it is a zero, your investment goes to zero. And I don't like that attribute. I would no, no, prefer to have well, companies. No, no, no. Because if you have a smart entrepreneur, while you see the thing taking a nosedive, and long before it takes a nosedive, you're inventing something new and reshaping it. Come on, we all have done that with our businesses. That's how we grew our businesses. You don't just come out of the gate with the perfect product and then say, "Oh, it's not a business because it's only a product," and now you might fail on it. Forget it. It's too. I don't. I don't know why you keep pushing that around. It doesn't make any sense. Now you know why I key your car in the parking lot every time we leave the set. <laughs> <laughs> 
Okay, this brings me to another question that has just come through Twitter, and this is from um, Cragen, at Cragen Design. It says, of course, sharks are all friends, but some snarking happens as, this, as it's happening right now. Um, any situations get really too intense that has kind of like broken the friendship at all? Well, there's that one, that, that one, uh, listen, I got to be honest. I had to intervene with the FAA to allow Barbara to fly her broom onto the set of Shark Tank. <laughs> okay. Oh. Uh, yeah, yeah. I think for the most part, my my history is I I've only um, gotten to I've only gotten closer with the sharks, but after three four years of doing deals, you know who you feel either are a waste of time or they're too hard to get a hold of, and you, you have a camaraderie, but kind of a you still have a, I don't want to be bothered with this person in this sense or that sense, but we're very, very competitive on, on, the, on the stage because yeah, you're, it's to, real to, money. To your point, Damon, I think the biggest threat to any of the friendships as the seasons go from one to the next to the next is doing deals together. You know, it, it, it's not easy to get a great working partner in anything. And so when you do deals with different sharks, cut up the deal, you soon learn who you work well with, who you don't learn who you don't work well with and who you can really get a deal done with. And so I think that's the biggest threat to the friendships after a while. But you want to know, we all go in and out, we all have different opinions, and once we have that first drink at the end of the day, or Damon has his nine and Kevin drinks his four bottles of wine and whatever else, we all love each other again right away. No problem. No so problem. Okay. Well, I'm going to be honest. I like yeah. everybody. That's because you're new. <laughs> Lori, what was Lori, what was that lemonade stand comment you made a couple weeks ago? I thought I was set in love. <laughs> it was a good one. I, you know, Lori, Lori's so literal that she doesn't get some good stabs in and jabs, but she's getting really, really good these days. Yeah, that was a, that was a quick one. That was a quick yeah. jab. I like okay. that one, didn't you, Damon? I, I it tickled me. I love it. <laughs> you should tell folks what it was. Tell, tell, them, tell them quickly what the we story was. We about moving more product, and Lori said, I passed the lemonade stand moving more, <laughs> moving more product than you. <laughs> <laughs> that, was, that was an eye-opening. That was a good one. Um, okay, next question. This comes in from the website. Um, Yasmin Ephraim it says, other than profits to be gained, what would you say you look for in a startup or an existing business to make an investment? So aside from the money, um, what do you look for when you're partnering up with these entrepreneurs? I look for the money. <laughs> That's what matters. That's the only reason I'm doing this. I'm trying to get richer. The whole concept is you want to go to bed richer than you woke up. It's that simple. I'm not trying to make friends. I'm trying to make money. I look for, I look for great people and great operators with new insights in, in new industries that no matter what happens, I probably will learn way more than they have and I'll be able to apply it to either the business that we're running and if that goes to zero, as Kevin would say, it would be applied to the businesses that I'm either going to acquire and or some of the businesses I currently have. Mm -hmm. and for me, okay. I have to say, I'm never really shooting for somebody who's inventing something totally new because that's one in 20 new businesses we hear on the set. That's it. Mm -hmm. One in 20 are brand new businesses. Everybody else is crowding somebody else's face. But for me, you know what I'm looking for? I'm looking for a high energy. I don't think any of us here know a single person who succeeded really well in business who didn't have a lot of energy, number one. I'm looking for somebody who I could trust, number two. And I'm looking for somebody that's going to make it through the finish line. Because Barbara, you're, you're so full of it that your eyes are brown because, you know, you know how many times somebody went on set, Barbara, and as soon as they left, you said, ah, oh, and they, was, they had so much energy, and you said, I would not be able to deal with that person every single time. I didn't say only, no, it's a pain in the ass. I'm not talking about that. Come on. I'm talking wow. about high energy to deliver the goods. You can't get somebody with low energy who becomes a good entrepreneur. I've never seen it, ever. Well, yeah. I was going to say, I, I look for what's great, whether it's a product or a business, if it's innovative, if it's new, if it's clever and unique, that's what attracts me. And I look for broad mass appeal. I look for things that the major uh, people in the marketplace are going to want or need. And then I also look mm -hmm. at who's that partner. Um, do they have drive? Do they have passion? Are they going to really fight to make that business work and run and help me to do it? So I look for all, all of those things. But most of what you say is the entrepreneur themselves. For me, well, I think it's really a 50-50 mix. Mm -hmm. It has to be something that's a great product or business that 
you know, back to the instant hero or zero. But if it's a hero, and it, what makes things a hero for me is things like broad mass appeal. Is it something that people really need and want? But, but Lori, sometimes you throw the entrepreneur under the bus. Remember that guy with the magnet that holds glasses? You bought the whole thing out, and then you threw him under the bus. We found tire tracks on his body the next morning. <laughs> that guy has hit four million in sales in less than a year. I'd like to go under that bus too. <laughs> <laughs> okay, we have next question. Uh, just coming in on Twitter. Um, it's from at Denver Katie. Would you ever invest in a small business that didn't have a written business plan? Good question. No. <laughs> Why would I invest in somebody who can't, who's too lazy to even write a business plan? Yeah, I got to go with Damon on that one. If you don't have time to put four slides together to explain what you're doing, you're basically a blind pool. I can do that on my own. I know how to burn money. I don't need any friends to show me how. Mm -hmm. I think that would be tough. I mean, my opinion, if something's great and they're just at the very beginning, it's a fledgling product, it just tells me that I'm going to have to put in 99.9% .9 of the work. But I agree with them. I mean, they should at least put forth an effort. You okay. know what? I have to say on so many of the businesses I invested in were startups, total startups, some with models, not even a product yet. And I'm not bothered if they don't have a business plan. Very often they don't have the skill set to write one. But what bothers me... Oh, gee, I can't wait to invest in that person. Oh, I've done it again and again. But before I put the finished money in, my course yet, I haven't finished, Kevin. Pipe down. Before I put the money in, what I'm doing is asking them to write how they're going to make money and how they're going to spend the money, what's it going to cost. So you might not call that a business plan. If they're unable to do that, I would never put my money in. And I have refused to put money in. But most people need a little guidance on how to do it if they don't have a Harvard MBA or have any business experience. And most great entrepreneurs come with no business experience. So I don't put a lot of value on that. But they better be able to put some common sense on paper when I ask them. For well, it. it's still common sense, Barbara. I mean, because no, a business mean, plan can be pretty sophisticated and intimidating for a heck of a lot I'm of people. Not talking, I'm not talking that. I'm, I'm talking about something where it shows a direction, it shows a one year, three year, five year, and ten year plan. Is there an exit strategy? How are you going to get your goods in? Pretty How are you going to sell them? Pretty you know. sophisticated for a lot of folks out there, I think. Well, I wrote one, and listen, you know, at this stage of my life, I'm dyslexic. I could barely write. So imagine 20 years ago, you had to see the one that I wrote. You know what you had 20 years ago, Damon? I read both of your books. What you had is the gift of bullshit come between those lips. And you could convince anybody to see your way of looking at life. <laughs> no, and let me tell you, your mouth can be the best business plan and far more valuable than anything you put on paper because you're standing on your feet every day and pitching people and getting them to get on your team and believe in your product. And you want to know that's the business plan that counts. That, you can't live with that. You can't succeed without that talent. You know, that's a lot of kumbaya, if you ask me. No, it's not. That's, that's, why, that's why Damon's good. I don't know why you're successful, but that's certainly you know, why Damon's I good. I think if you can't present a business plan, it's because you never made one. And frankly, there's so many deals. Why not just pick the ones where at least they put some thought into it? You don't see a lot of people coming on Shark Tank without some idea of what the plan is, because if they don't have one, they get fried alive. And it's yeah, happened. Let me tell you, remember, we saw so many entrepreneurs in this very season that had all the sophisticated language, all the background education, went to the best schools, and you know they were missing the number one card. They weren't good entrepreneurs, and they had everything. Yeah, nobody's Barbara, but nobody's saying if you have a business plan that you automatically have drive or intelligence, but at least you, there's a stage one where you have to tell me, you know, how are you think you money. I think. Well, there's levels. There's <laughs> levels. <laughs> It doesn't have to be the most sophisticated, but at least have some type of an idea. Yeah, an idea. Comments Where you want to go. What's going to happen. <laughs> yeah. How do I make Great. Money? Okay. <laughs> Excellent. So, um, divergent points of view, which is great. That's why there are many of you, as opposed to just one. So, uh, another question coming in from the website. This is from Sarah Sterwix. Um, what is something you failed to prepare for when you launched your business and um, and you had to learn the hard way? Can you, something Who you wants to take to that? Prepare for? Yeah, it, what, what is something that you, basically a mistake you made, you failed to prepare for when launching your business and that you had to learn it the hard way? You had to learn the lesson the hard way. I guess the, the question really is what's the biggest business lesson you've learned? I didn't have financial intelligence, and um, I risked everything that I had, and I more than likely would have ended up being bankrupt. And a lot of times, financial intelligence just comes with 
a lot of the small things you do to operate business. I mean, businesses, you know, as Robert would always say, it's either more sales or less costs and operations. And I didn't have financial intelligence. So yeah. um, that was my biggest challenge. And thank God I was, I partnered up with people who, who had that, that understanding and that I can learn. Mm -hmm. For me, you know what, uh, what, what I, uh, I'm sorry, Kevin, go ahead. No, no, I, I was just, I was just going to say that the biggest lesson I learned was, you know, when I was trying to raise money, only having one source. In other words, you're out trying to, I was trying to raise $50 million during the period that the learning company was growing. And I, I let myself get sucked into only having one source of that. And when it, when we came to close, that source went away. You always need two options or three options. So from that day on, having learned that lesson, I'll never do that again. When I raise money for businesses, I make sure I have three or four sources and they're competing with each other. Because if you bet the farm on one source, you always get screwed. Mm -hmm. uh, I'll say for me, um, I wish I had more than one source. I never even had one. I mean, I would, I would like kiss their butt if they gave me a source of money in those early years. But for me, the best lesson I learned was by happenstance, which was how to generate publicity for my brand. And that I learned out of need, as we all as entrepreneurs learn most of our most valuable lessons out of need. And what I needed was some way to advertise and get customers for my seven salespeople that I had at the time. And so I published a report totally like that. I just wish you'd done that with your clothes on. <laughs> <laughs> Very funny. But let me tell you, the report I published was a statistical report. It was simply an average sale price for Manhattan property because I was in the brokerage business. And it appeared on the front page of the New York Times with me at the front line quote. Boy, was that a learning lesson to read my own name in print and suddenly have great credibility in my market as though I was a big player when I was just a little fish. Boy, I started churning out reports for the rest of my life knowing the power of the press. So I think free publicity was probably the best and earliest lesson I learned, totally by happenstance. I can't imagine why an entrepreneur wouldn't publish a report on their own industry, because it is the easiest way to get press. Yeah. Okay, very good. All right, we've got um, more questions that are coming in. Here's another one just coming in on Twitter um, from at Drink Zoos. Um, are you less likely to invest in a company that has only one founder behind it? So someone who's kind of like a a one man or one woman show. Are you less likely to invest in that person or someone who has partner or partners? I like I, teams. I like teams. I don't like single entrepreneurs. I like that way. If one gets run over by a bus, at least you have something less. <laughs> I don't mind if it's a single entrepreneur at all. I think it sometimes it's easier. I like yeah. singles. Okay. Yeah. Mm -hmm. It depends who you get in the package. For me, I have a. Uh, um, with Robert Hershevec, I invested in a, a, a bike grease company. It sounds terrible, called Monkey Wipes. Great product, great packaging, great team. Yeah. But what I didn't know is one was a winner, one was a loser. And I got stuck with the loser when the winner went back to graduate school. I invested mm -hmm. in uh, pork barrel barbecue sauce. Two great attorneys, one stronger than the other. The recent didn't deal you call one of those guys a pig? Those, the, the, yeah, well, of course, he looked like a pig. <laughs> hey, that's not my fault. He just happened to look that way. Blame it on his mother. But here's the thing: with the lot, of, I have found the great majority of my strongest businesses are teams. I have to say, it's not like I even consciously think of it. But two strong members are terrific. But then, hey, Ken, you know, Damon, how about the, the the chubby lady clothes? How about what was our reaction when we found that the person who really ran our business was that husband of hers? That was horrible. That was like a surprise part. Right. That's why. That's, that's why I like. Oh, that's why I like yeah. singles because you never know who's behind door number two. Yeah. Right. <laughs> and it's pleasingly plump. <laughs> pleasingly plump. Okay. Rubenesque. Okay. Rubenesque. <laughs> pleasing. Plump. <Germany> curves. <laughs> okay, we're gonna take a, take another question. This one. Um, uh, this one came in from uh, on Twitter. Uh, Joseph Colbert um, at. F-U-Z-C-O-V, and talking about China's demand for American branded products, um, do you find that to be growing or slowing? I think well, it's growing, personally. I think that the Chinese uh, market really loves American products, and I think they're just hungry. They're almost starving for them. They want more and more and more, and I think that um, that's actually growing. And I think it's a big opportunity for us in America to help boost our economy by selling more goods to the Chinese market and not the reverse. If you could produce them at the right price. Mm -hmm. I agree. Yeah. 
You need a okay. partner doing okay. a deal like that. It's very tricky to um, invest in China. And I'm going to show you a little picture here. All those guys out in that room that you're seeing right now. There's nobody there. They all went home. I swear to God, there's no 40, one there. Forty percent of their time is in looking at Chinese deals. That's what we do because the growth is in China. They're growing still at 7.2 percent, and we in America are growing at under two. So you have to keep China on your radar because that's where there's a new middle class emerging. And Laurie's right. They're going to buy a lot of American stuff from us. We just don't know how to sell it to them yet. Yeah, because you need a guy, a distributor, or somebody you know on land there t bringing it in. Or if you don't have a partner, then they're going to go and, and, and really do it themselves. Right. Exactly. Okay, very good. Um, next question coming in, <clears throat> or that came in um, uh, a little bit earlier. Um, what about, uh, this is from, um, it came through our website. What if someone is an, is an introvert? and they're terrible at pitching. They might have all the energy in the world and they're so excited and maybe they have a great product and sales, but they're really introverted. Um, take them up behind the barn, take them up behind the barn and shoot them. It's that I agree. Mm -hmm. They're not going to sell. They're never well, going to succeed unless they get a partner. They need, I, I was just going to say, you know, you don't need to shoot them <laughs> behind the barn. <laughs> you can simply get a person that can step up to the plate for them and be that outspoken salesperson who has the passion and the drive and the enthusiasm. You know, if you think about mm -hmm. all the deals we see on Shark Tank, so many of them couldn't sell and they never got bought. Kiss a death. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Very good. Next, uh, next coming in from uh, Twitter. Um, this is from uh, A.V. Zubar. Um, what was the biggest rejection you had to overcome? And how did you get over it in your own businesses? Well, I'll jump in there. I don't mean to go first again. I'm trying to. Hey, you know what, guys? I'm gonna I'm gonna answer one last one with you guys. I'll just okay. hop and leave and so leave. talk about your rejection of your first girlfriend, second, third, fourth, and fifth. Damon, go ahead. That never that never happened, Barb. That ah. <laughs> or best pitching tip, Damon. Whatever your last words are, are go for it. All right. Answer the question one last time. What are your best my best pitching tips? Um, sure, I, I think that's probably in terms of broader. Since you're you're going to hop out, that would be great. I think the best pitching tips are first of all come out with a very strong statement or action. You know that that separates you immediately and grab the attention within the first ten seconds. Um, be able to uh, explain your idea, your concept, and how it's good for the person you're pitching to within ninety seconds. Um, those are and 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 can you also find a way to relate and make sure that the product and or the concept relates to a challenge or a joy that the person you're pitching to uh, has in their life. If you put those three elements together, I think you'll have the perfect pitch along with your product. Mm -hmm. Okay, excellent. Thanks, Sam. I know you have another uh, engagement. All right, see you guys tomorrow night at 9 o'clock. Bye, Damon. Bye, Sharks. I will be fighting with you tomorrow, but I love you today. Oh, I know. <laughs> you have to, to he's classic, classic tomorrow night, Damon. <laughs> I'm going to soak that guy. <laughs> so you make him angry now thinking about him, but all right. <laughs> Can't um, wait to watch. I'm going to have to jump out, too. I apologize. I'll answer one last question. Okay, great. Well, let's, great. let's make this the last one. We'll close it down. Right. We'll see everybody yeah. tomorrow at night. Okay, let's let's make this the last one. Um, what is your what would be your best advice for entrepreneur, entrepreneurs either pitching you on Shark Tank or pitching in general their business? I'll go first. I would say my best advice is number one, really know everything that you can about your business plan or your product, mm -hmm. so that whatever you're asked you know about it in an answer in confidence because there's nothing worse than this is your baby it's your idea and you can't answer something then you don't seem like somebody who has uh, your act together or that's going to be a good partner mm -hmm. so okay. um, I think that that's probably the first most important thing and then the second thing would be you know drive and enthusiasm about it that you're going to do whatever it takes to make that work Okay, I say I say it's about the numbers. If you don't know your numbers, I want to release the hound. <laughs>
just I can't what, stand it. What it's, numbers, you Kevin? Question. You said you'd simply say, "What are your gross margins?" And I, you, they don't know the answer. That should be what in Roman times they put you to death. It's that simple. I'm going to, uh, I'm going to give what are, you, Kevin. What are the key factors they need to know? Well, you know, you, if go back you have to Kev for a second. Okay, Kevin? so I'm just saying, if you have a product or a business plan, and a basic question is, at what volume would you break even? In other words, we know you're losing money now, but what do you have to sell to break even? And you can't answer a question like that. In Roman times, you would lose your head. I'd like to reinstitute that policy. You finished. <laughs> Yes. Okay. Um, I want to offer an example yeah, versus an answer. Uh, and okay. the example is a business I just recently bought into called Cousins Maine Lobster. Two hustlers from Maine. And what they did when they got a potential pick on Shark Tank is they watch every episode from the beginning of the Shark Tank first season right up to the end of last season. They wrote down every, I mean, it's a nut job. These are not accountants. These are hustlers. They wrote down every question every shark had ever asked in columns to get the lay of the land. They had written down who bought what deal and why, were the reasons given. And what they had that I have never seen before in my life is enormous preparation. And if you recall the day on the set, they knocked out answers. You couldn't trip those guys up. And they didn't sound slick. They were prepared. I have never seen that depth of preparation. And so if for any entrepreneur planning to go on Shark Tank, I mean, why wouldn't you over prepare? And now I you're agree. dating both of them, Barbara. What? Now you're dating both of them, let's face it. <laughs> in, in my parting words, because I'm sorry, I, I have to jump off. I have a commitment. Um, sure. I just want to sure. say tomorrow night is really an amazing Shark Tank and I hope everybody can tune in to watch it because something happens that I have never seen before and uh, Seth MacFarlane will be there and uh, I also I have an hour show on QVC right the hour before Shark Tank from 8 to 9 and Shark Tank moves to 9 p.m. tomorrow night and I have I'm launching an item from Shark Tank that was one of Mark Cuban's deals with the kiss ticks, um, it's a new configuration. So, hope you can be there and for time, both. And what time, Lori? What time is it on tomorrow? Uh, the new time? Eight, eight p.m. tomorrow night. My show on QVC, and then nine p.m. An amazing Shark Tank, which I just I think anybody that's a Shark Tank fan has to watch that episode. <laughs> Very good. Okay, and with that. Lori, you've, you've wrapped it up nicely for, for us. Um, well, thank you so much for all of you for joining us. This is fantastic. And for anyone who has um, who missed this or missed any part of it, uh, we're going to have this archived and up on our site um, within the hour. So you'll be able to tune into the entire, uh, to the entire chat. Thank you so much. Again, um, if you didn't know already, uh, Shark Tank is moving to 9 p.m. tomorrow, in case you didn't get that from all the sharks. And um, we will see you then. Thank you and so I much. I add one thing. Uh, Kevin, sure. Barbara, you kissed, remember? How could remember, I remember that I've kiss? have doctors ever since. Yes. Well, that's, that's the item that's going to be in my show tomorrow night. It's a new version of I'm the kiss. I'm not watching. It, it's which you, memories. Which you must have so that you can remember that moment. Oh, no. I remember, I turned to stone. <laughs> People are still asking me, why did I do it? <laughs> Bye, everybody. Bye-bye, um, everybody. Bye. Thank you so much, Sharks. Thank you. Thank you.